Hello. Yeah, hello. My name everybody. is Dr. Yuzula. Hello. This hello. Is Dr. My Karsten. name is Karsten Nicholas. I'm uh, from Germany, so I'm uh, living and practicing nearby Munich and Augsburg. And um, since 29 years, I'm focused on tick-borne diseases. Uh, that means um, um, that uh, we have uh, mostly pa uh, patients from um, these uh, subjects. Um, meanwhile, it's uh, really a challenge because uh, tick-borne diseases are multisystemic illnesses and mostly we see um, chronic, multiple chronic infectious diseases syndrome. So Dr. Karsten, can you tell us just so that everybody knows, is it true that you can get uh, Lyme disease not just from the tick? Ticks, but more. No, uh, they are different uh, vectors, meanwhile known, so most often you will get uh, transmission um, of Lyme disease or other tick-borne diseases uh, based on a tick bite or a tick attachment, but meanwhile there is a safe sign that also other uh, biting or su sucking insects can transmit, like normal mosquito that had been confirmed here in Europe, in Finland and in Germany, and uh, horseflies, for example, could be one of these vectors, um, but even if you had been bitten by um, uh, wild or um, a domestic animal like a dog um, or a cat uh, could lead to um, uh, infection with tick-borne diseases. And even lice, right? Yeah, lice and mites uh, mm -hmm. could be also responsible for some of the tick-borne diseases. Right. So how can we diagnose because tests are very yeah, hard? The, the diagnostic is really a challenge in that field, you know. Um, unfortunately, we are lacking of really very good and accurate testing. So uh, in most of the countries where Lyme disease or these tick-borne diseases are prevalent, uh, we have access to something which is called two-tier testing. Mm -hmm. That means uh, there's a standard serological test method called ELISA testing. And if that is uh, positive, means if there's any pathological finding, um, um, we have to confirm this by a more precise testing called Western blot. Unfortunately, the accuracy or sensitivity of ELISA is not even 50%. That um, leads very often to false negative test results. Uh, with other words, um, up to every second patient can fail uh, in that type of testing. So our believing is that the Western blot uh, with sensitivity mostly between 85 and up to 95% would be the better option um, uh, to go on testing. Uh, but it is how it is. Um, there are um, uh, regulation in most of the countries to, um, uh, to, uh, which have uh, decided for the other model. Um, beside on the serological testing, we have um, uh, meanwhile uh, some other good ones. So there's a, a relatively uh, big group of what we call cellular testings. Mm -hmm. uh, that is um, former uh, lymphocyte transformation uh, test uh, method. Um, uh, the problem with LTTs was um, it was never standardized and there was no general acceptance in most of the countries. But this had changed uh, in year 2008 um, when some um, uh, high-tech companies um, brought uh, a new standardized method um, on the former based LTT on the market. And this te uh, technique is called Elispot or iSpot um, um, uh, technique. Uh, beside of that, um, as a very good um, uh, chronic um, uh, parameter or uh, mon monitoring parameter for chronic infectious diseases, uh, we also use the CD57 yes. cell test, which is most common in the US and meanwhile in, uh, uh, in Europe as well. And um, other uh, methods like uh, PCR testing, means looking for the DNA, um, are also uh, on the market. Uh, unfortunately, um, the uh, DNA testing is very specific, but um, the um, uh, sensitivity is also, uh, also uh, very weak. So in body fluids, only up to 30, if you're lucky, to 40 percent. And um, in biopsies, uh, means um, uh, other um, uh, material like biopsies from lymph node or skin, um, a bit more than 50 percent uh, could be helpful. And um, our recommendation is not to go only on one type of testing, means not only the serology. So if you have access to many of them, uh, yeah, um, uh, to do these cross tests, because then you have much better chances finally to get um, um, a valid diagnosis. And beside of that, so diagnostic is not all. So if you go into the medical books, you will very often find um, that many of these uh, diagnoses of tick-borne disease are based on clinical finding. So I guess um, uh, there should be really some more expertise and knowledge 
um, uh, of doctors, uh, sometimes it's relatively easy if you listen exactly to your patient, if you examine um, uh, 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 your patient very good, uh, to get first hint of um, uh, one of these infectious diseases. Right. And I also wanted to mention that you can get it congenitally from mom and yeah. from the breast milk, right? Yeah, so. exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, this is also a very important point. So mm -hmm. um, uh, we know that um, in um, uh, women who are chronic L um, or late stage Lyme disease, there's an always 20% chance of transmission congenital. Mm -hmm. And uh, unfortunately, if, um, if a pregnant woman will get a tick bite during pregnancy, the risk um, is um, raising up to 80%. And yeah. um, this is uh, mostly not known uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the population, mm -hmm. and especially uh, many doctors are lacking of this, uh, yes. uh, of this information because it's so important um, um, or to get more awareness uh, even in pregnancy um, because it's relatively easy um, to support women not to transmit the infection uh, onto the fetus and um, having uh, less or no problems later on. And let's just say for Lyme disease it's not just Borrelia but other? No, uh, mm -hmm. many of the other uh, co-infection uh -huh. and um, just to mention it, we, are, uh, we differentiate between two groups of additional infectious diseases. So the real co-infection are those ones who will be transmitted with the same tick bite. Uh -huh. So this is mostly a parasitic infection um, called Babesia and many other bacterial infections like Bartonella, Anaplasma, Ehrlichia, Rickettsia and some more. And we see um, a, a second group of uh, which we call more secondary infection. Um, this is based on the fact that Borrelia is able to downscale the host immune uh, response and that leads most often to an open um, uh, upper respiratory tract. That means uh, you're, um, uh, there's a high risk of acquiring um, uh, additionally airborne transmitted infection. And so we have noted that in more of 80% of patients with chronic Lyme, they have uh, problems with chlamydia pneumonia, for example, in more than 80%. Um, we see in around 30% minimum mycoplasma pneumonia mm -hmm. um, uh, from the bacterial side and um, uh, um, a lot more from the uh, classical viral side. Um, so very common are Epstein-Barr virus infections, so mononucleosis, then Cytomegalo, Coxsackie, HHV6, um, the herpes group in general, and Borna virus infection are also very common. And this is something which um, definitely has a lot of impact um, and, um, in, in the general condition and shape of patients. So it's most important before starting any treatment uh, to have real, a complete picture of all what had happened and uh, really um, um, uh, complete information about the current status. Mm -hmm. If you uh, put these together, it's like uh, uh, setting up a mosaic. As more pictures you will have, as better and clearer the picture is, and then you can outcome. start really good, um, at, uh, good kind of treatment. So treatment, that's a big topic. Yeah, big, uh, <laughs> so we can talk hours about yes. this topic for sure, but to keep it simple and, uh -huh. um, and um, uh, I, I try my very best uh, to give you an overview uh, uh -huh. what is going on. So in general we are talking about infectious diseases. So the first approach would be definitely based on um, conventional antimicrobials means antibiotics. Uh -huh. um, uh, so meanwhile uh, there's a huge bunch of different uh, antibiotics and uh, this might be also a challenge because uh, many doctors are not aware that um, uh, uh, many of these um, uh, standard antibiotics are able to um, target and to kill the original spirochetal forms and this is similar to many of the co-infection but they will fail in what we call polymorphic forms. So for Borrelia we know um, that uh, they can hide in other body cells so being um, an intracellular bug mm -hmm. so many of the antibiotics which are most often recommended do not have any access to the intracellular space for example. The other problem is um, uh, especially Borrelia is able um, uh, to move in other shapes. Um, so we have um, temporarily intermediate forms called blebs, uh, we have though called round body form that are the former cystic form and uh, again it's the same uh, many antibiotics are not able to target and to kill these polymorphic forms. And um, so as a good and um, experienced doctor, you need um, uh, all this information 
finally to figure out the best treatment approach. It does not make any sense to start treatment with antibiotics who don't have access into the intracellular space, who don't um, uh, target and kill the polymorphic forms, then the treatment will fail. So at the beginning patient will notice some improvement uh, but at the very end they will get relapses and this is one of the issues. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so you know but uh, what is with all the patients who do not tolerate um, antibiotics or um, uh, can't um, go on uh, this type of uh, medication due to other reasons mm -hmm. and um, this was really for a long time a challenge. Um, but uh, they are meanwhile really good approaches. So um, uh, you can find good protocols in homeopathy, uh, in naturopathy uh, approaches, and um, also in uh, traditional Chinese medicine. And um, uh, we have started around 15 years ago uh -huh. um, using uh, these different um, uh, treatment approaches. And um, so basically our uh, clinic approach is more um, based on what we call a holistic approach. Um, 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 and the best outcome so far, what we have noticed, is really based on um, specific naturopathic compound. Um, and uh, we have good science, meanwhile, in the background. Um, a comparison between um, these um, naturopathic approaches uh, versus um, real um, antibiotics. And uh, I have to mention that the alternative protocols are, meanwhile, very close um, mm -hmm. uh, to the uh, outcome, means um, good treatment success. And uh, this is important. And um, uh, by the way, the, the only difference between uh, these conventional approaches and, uh, for example, the two passive approaches is the length of treatment. Um, so on average, we can say that um, uh, you will get nearly the same outcome, but you will um, uh, need um, uh, two to three times longer treatment uh, to reach that goal. And not to mention with long treatment with antibiotics, then your microbiome suffers. Exactly. So you have to make you know, sure that yeah, you This is uh, definitely an issue which you should always keep in mind. Um, going on these conventional antibiotics, um, uh, you have to look for the collateral damages and yes. that could have some impact. So, you know, we try to minimize um, um, these, um, these damages, but uh, you can't exclude that in 100%. And uh, this is sometimes also the limitation of such treatment approaches. Well, thank you so much for devoting some time to talk to me today. Yeah, it was Dr. a pleasure. Dr. Karsten is the leading expert in Lyme disease, and he is based in Germany with his uh, practice uh, that deals with Lyme disease, right? Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, it was a pleasure talking to you, and hopefully see you soon somewhere in the U.S. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. There you go. Good. <laughs>